Join us at Australia's famous Bondi Beach. We visit the Swiss Grand Hotel and go wild with the menu on Dining Down Under. Welcome to another episode of Dining Down Under. I'm Vic Cherikoff. Benjamin Christie. And Mark McCluskey. We're cooking at what you'd call it, an iconic location. The eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> Apart from Jerry Springer. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, so have I. No, Bondi Beach. Bondi Beach, well everybody knows it. Most tourists, most visitors and certainly most Australians know Bondi Beach. We're cooking at the Swiss Grand, which is right on the parade at, Cam at, um, uh, at Bondi. And here is an international hotel doing some really innovative cooking. They're using native Australian ingredients already. Um, chef there, Guido Van Balen, has even choreographed enormous events and functions with, uh, with native Australian cuisine. Oh, really? So our recipes today are inspired from the Swiss Grand. And Benjamin, what are you cooking? I'm doing an Illawarra cheesecake today with uh, ricotta cheese, yogurt, and I'm using a ginger biscuit in the biscuit base today, not normal butterscotch or scotch finger biscuits. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, and the ginger's gonna go well with the Illawarra plum. It combined very, very well. With the, uh, the pine notes, the plum flavors of the Illawarra plum with ginger is a great combination. I'm using the syrup. We made up syrup. For the plums, okay. The plums. And Mark? Well, I'm gonna be using a boned out veal shank. Uh, I always think it's better off the bone, the veal shank, easier to cook. Mm -hmm. We're going to be using some paper bark. We're going to put that in foil and wrap it. We're going to be adding a few of the vegetables to add the characteristics and the flavour in there. And we've got some potatoes. To dress the potatoes up, we're going to be using some of the Australian olive oil. With the Australian olive oil, we're going to infuse it with mint, native mint. And uh, Australian olive oil is grown in most of the wine regions of Australia. And, and so there are so many different forms, so many different varieties of, of olive oil. You can go from a very grassy note to a very light olive oil flavour. Well, this is actually a light olive oil flavour. That is why the native mint and a lot of the native herbs and spices work really well. Great, so you're not actually trying to overpower a flavour, you're complementing it. That's correct. My dish is a, um, a kangaroo loin, strip loin, with a uh, little bit of bush tomato chutney, Done as almost a bruschetta style because I'm working on the, uh, the bush tomato and tomato and so on. You'll see how this one turns up. <clears throat> Meanwhile, have a look at the Swiss Grand Hotel on Bondi Beach and enjoy. See you soon. Right across the road from the famous Bondi Beach is a Swiss Grand Hotel where the chefs have been using native Australian flavours with otherwise ordinary ingredients. One dish they prepared used paper bark, which was thin to a workable sheet. It's a traditional Aboriginal food wrap and was used quite a bit across the country. As a fusion with South Pacific cuisine, the chef also used banana leaves for this seafood dish. The fish fillets are seasoned with Oz lemon and a touch of diluted gum leaf oil for that hint of the Australian bush. The parcel is wrapped up with the leaf first and then the moist paper bark is folded up, little parcels then ready for baking. This prepared parcel could also be scorched on a hot plate or in a hot pan or just oven baked, but the hotter the heat, the better the smoky flavour that the fish picks up. Some warrigal greens get wilted and then finished with a little Australian olive oil. English spinach is a good substitute for these greens. The plate comes together. First off, greens go on and the parcel gets open, releasing those wonderful aromatics. Some Illawarra plum chutney complements the paper bark fish and the greens and then for a bit of colour and a bit of interest, quenelles of Kumara mash.
Our next dish starts with Spanish onions, which get sweated in oil but not browned. Then we add some diced mango and some fresh dill. For that hint of sweetness, some aromatic ginger jam finishes the salsa until later. A kangaroo fillet is seared on both sides and then finished in the oven to medium rare. As always, it gets rested before it's sliced. A game stock with dark cherry juice is reduced and then the cherries added right at the last bit. A kumra mash gets warmed and then seasoned with some cracked pepper and it's ready for service. Finally, the dish comes together in layers. A mould is used and the salsa goes in first. Kumra is then worked over the top and the moulds removed. So this arrangement is going to give us height ready for the slices of roux to be fanned out on top. On goes the cherry jus. This is a great combination of fruit and game. A little bit of cream gives the dish colour and deep fried kumra provides the height to finish. Don't you love it out the backyard, Barbie? <laughs> Kangaroo is one of my favourite meats. It's actually so lean that um, it's certainly going to keep you fit and trim. Okay, so I've been eating other things as well. <laughs> but the good thing about kangaroo is that uh, because it is lean with just body fat, not being on game meat, the main fat contribution is actually polyunsaturated fat from the nervous tissue and so on in the meat. So it's almost like your margarine equivalent of beef. Uh, very, very healthy. But what it means is it takes a little bit of care when you're cooking it on the barbecue. And particularly when it's got such a, a small section of meat as well, so I'm not a great believer in, in putting too much flavour onto meat first because you can maybe just a dash of some sweet soy and not a great deal again. It's going to burn on the barbecue, particularly with the heat. And again, dipping meat in oil from my point of view, um, say I was to oil it or to put a flavour oil at this stage, all it tends to do is cause the barbecue to flare up, which okay, it looks good and you can sort of work amongst the flames there. But the problem with that is that suddenly you've got a higher temperature as the oils burn and it actually makes the oxidising oils that are in the meat, you get off flavours from too much flame when you're barbecuing. So a high heat, sear the meat rather quickly and um, turn it once if you can. Turning meat often starts the juices moving from the surface of the meat to the, uh, or from the inside to the outside, tends to dry it. You really want to be able to cook it once, turn it over, finish it for the second cooking and that's enough. Then when the meat's hot and you're resting it, that's the time to start applying flavours, native flavours, pepper, salt, conventional, native, it doesn't matter. Put the flavours on last. Also, if you salt the meat before you cook it, all that happens is you get the juices trying to dilute out the salt crust. You just killed all my cooking techniques there, mate. Well, Shot mate, them in. that's okay. Sometimes it, uh, it pays to educate experienced chefs. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, again, what we're really looking at is the science of food and then applying the science of food to uh, some almost traditional cooking techniques and a lot of food myths. Uh, Benjamin, over to you. I've just melted the butter and I'm putting it into the breadcrumb mix. Mixed it up. You can even... You don't want it too dry, you don't want it too wet. You just want an even consistency and not too oily. We'll pack it into the, uh, the Darien mould and it's really, really easy. Just Darien mould? What's a Darien mould? Uh, traditionally used for, to make cook brulees or, or cream, cream caramels. Oh, so it's the name of the dish? Name of the dish. Okay. Uh, you can use different, you can even make larger cheesecakes, you can use spring form, spring form uh, Molds? pans. Yep. And if you're you know, they, they're the ones that have the spring on the yep. side and plate comes out underneath. No worries, mate. So we've put all the ginger, ginger biscuit crust in the, into the, to the mould. And then before we put the mix in, off to the fridge. This is the one I did earlier and it's even right around. So then now to the mix. I'm going to start off with vanilla bean. Very expensive. And we'll just slice it straight down the centre. 
from Madagascar. Or Indonesia. Originally. <laughs> and we just, inside is a, is a lot of little seeds. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the knife, the back of the knife, just to scoop them all out. And with the vanilla bean, actually, when it's a fresh product, it doesn't have any flavor whatsoever. It's only when it becomes dried that the flavor gets intensified. And we'll probably only use one, one half. But with the vanilla bean, once you've used the seeds inside, you can put it into just caster sugar and get vanilla sugar after that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we'll put that into there. I do that with lemon myrtle and end up with lemon myrtle sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so yogurt in there now. Bit of ricotta. Let's put that in as well. Actually, we'll put a fair bit in. And then we'll mix that up. And you can see in there already the vanilla bean seeds throughout. Put an egg in as well. Benjamin, as you're mixing and uh, whisking, maybe we flick across to Mark and uh, move on with the veal. So what I'll do is I've got my, um, my veal here on the board. I've got some foil. Which you keep rattling. Yes. <laughs> and some uh, paper bark. I'm going to put the veal shank on top of the paper bark and add some of smoked ham. The smoked ham is going to be the salt for the dish. It's going to impart a lovely flavour throughout. We're going to use some turnip as well. Slice a bit of that off. Chop it up into nice little fingers. Put that in the centre. It's going to have a lovely, I suppose you could say, I don't know, aniseedy flavour, Vic. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll just roll that over like so. So again, stopping the meat, stopping the fats from touching the foil. That's right. Great cooking sense. And that's ready to roll. That's ready to roll, mate. Benjamin, how are you doing? Just a little bit more sugar. And I'm going to mix that in. I've preheated the, uh, the oven already. I'm just going to put a little bit of the Illawarra plum syrup in there. So I've had my uh, meat cooked on the barbecue. Looks great. And it's resting now, and as it starts to rest, that's where I'm going to add my native herbs to allow the flavour to start to infuse. Mate, we had a bit of a discussion before about <laughs> discussion. seasoning meats. Yep. Now, I believe that you should season meat, especially when you're marinating meats. I ah. believe you need to really penetrate, get the flavours into the meat. No, I agree. Marinating is right. If you're having the herbs, spices in a liquid form, mm. uh, sitting around the meat for a while, even accompanied with red wine, with perhaps some oil as well, the flavours then can penetrate the meat and that's fair go. What I'm suggesting um, and my point in argument okay. is simply not to have herbs on the top of the meat or even pepper and then applying open heat on the barbecue, for example, you'll just cook off all the volatiles and it's almost a waste of herb. Fair enough. Point, point taken? taken, point taken. Thank you. Well, I might just put this veal shank in the oven to cook about 160 degrees for three hours. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about flavoring olive oil. Now with olive oil, the best thing to do with olive oil, if you want it to infuse the oil very fast, you can put it in a dish, you can warm the oil slightly. That'll help to um, infuse the flavour quickly. The best way of doing it is like that, or you can soak it overnight for two or three days. That'll give you a really strong, rich flavour. We don't have that amount of time, so it's going in the microwave for two or three seconds. There we go. Well, while that's happening, what I'm going to do is get a couple of the potatoes. With these potatoes, we're going to drizzle them with the finished product, the finished oil. One, two, three. That should just about do it. And you can really smell the flavours starting to come through, starting yep. to work yep. with that. Just a small application of heat works really well. And so you don't, uh, you might lose some of the uh, vitamin E that uh, olive oil is so well uh, renowned for Definitely. because it's cold pressed. That's right. Um, you might lose it there, but as you pour it back into a stock and flavour it more, you make a concentrate here, put it back in the standard oil and you end up with a great product. Definitely. So let's turn these boring potatoes into interesting potatoes. There we go, some native Australian minted olive oil. Bit of a drizzle there. And just a little bit on the top and into the oven they go with the veal shank. Benjamin, I know you're just over the sink there, mate, but how's this going? We only finished off the cheesecake. Just putting the cheesecake mix into the ginger crusted durial moles. They're going in there now. And I thought just to give it a bit of an interesting touch, just put a bit of the syrup again on top. 
and then just mixing it around with, with a toothpick or a skewer just to give it that extra bit of presentation on top. I'm going to put those in the oven now for about, oh, about 35 minutes. I hope that looks awesome. Put those straight in. And as I was saying before, with olive oil, you can, you can do it this way as well. Just put about half a teaspoon of the native mint into a good quality Australian olive oil. There we go. So we put that in there, put the lid on the bottle, give it a bit of a shake, put that on the shelf, and in a few days, that's gonna have a really strong characteristic flavor. How long is it gonna last for? Forever, pretty much. I, I, oil does go rancid, but only when it oxidizes. You, um, I mean, a point to note here, if you were, say, uh, putting a pepper, a conventional pepper, into olive oil in that way, uh, the way that pepper's grown and dried and handled and out in the open air and then actually traded around the world, there's a quite a high microbial load that is bacteria on it. Um, very high, in fact, and it can cause a few problems if you look at just adding a cold pepper to cold oil. Um, you will get some growth, you'll get a little bit of fuzz, it's time to throw out the oil. But the best way to do that is, as we discussed earlier, where you warm the oil, mm. effectively cook the pepper in the hot oil, yep. sterilise it and then add it to your stock base. We'll put that recipe on the website for you, just as an aside. Benjamin, you're nearly done. I'm finished, waiting for the cheesecakes to come out of the oven. Okay, I'll be um, starting to uh, prep here. I've um, diced up some tomatoes. And um, what I'm going to do is um, just make a small, move back here, a small mix, which is a, a, quite a favourite flavour of mine. In fact, could I get some native mint as well? I'll use Certainly. that in this dish as well. Would you like some thyme as well? Um, how much? <laughs> Wait, you mean how long? There so all I'm going to use is some chopped tomato. Uh, this is a mix of onion, Bush tomatoes, which just to remind you, these are little bush tomatoes here. We've cooked those up and um, they can be the pulverised, they're going to be commercially available shortly as a, 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 under the name of a kudgera. Uh, are all around the world, in fact, this is now starting to be uh, cultivated as an interesting spice. And about 3% in a standard tomato chutney or relish, 3% of a kudgera will change your ordinary everyday relish into something quite special. And because there's so much intensity of flavour here, I can actually mix it with ordinary tomatoes. And these are tomatoes that have been skinned. I've got some little extra shallots there that have been pan fried just for a bit of colour. A little bit of native mint to infuse. Mm, and that's nice. the basis of my little tartlets with kangaroo. And summarising the dishes for today, what we have is braised veal shank with native mint drizzled pink eye potatoes, kangaroo strip loin bruschetta, and a baked Illawarra plum cheesecake. So I'm just finishing up my kangaroo bruschetta. Looks very nice, Vic. Looks good. Well, we're going to be eating around the plate as well. A little bit of pepper sauce and a little bit of a sweeter syrup, a little bit of Illawarra plum. We've already got our bush tomato chutney in the middle, a little bit of garnish. And the best way to eat these, dip them in the sauce and eat them because that puts the flavour on your tongue. I'm going to go and join our guests and leave you guys to plate up. What I'm going to do is finish up putting my potatoes on the plate, put the veal on the plate there, a little bit of watercress. And then as Vic says, we're going to be eating around the plate today. So put a bit of sauce there. Over to you, Benjamin. I'm, I'm actually finished. Sorbet's on. Cheesecake. I'm going to meet you out there, Mark. Let's eat. Guys, welcome. Tom, you've got a whole host of things to eat. And I've got a letter to read. Before I do, don't forget the recipes that we've seen today and uh, that we've cooked today and also seen today on the show are all on the website, so have a look at that. They look fantastic today. I think that's uh, we've done well. These pastry cases lend themselves to all sorts of fillings and the rare roast meat and wild tomato chutney makes only one of dozens of possible finger foods. Mark's dish of slow cooked shanks was creatively reassembled to make filled rounds of meat and then served with Hasselback pink eye potatoes. 
cheesecake is one of my favourite desserts, and Ben's Illawarra Plum Cheesecake is a delicious use of these plum and pine flavoured fruits. Mm. Our letter, all the way from Montreal in Canada. Letter from Fulma Schulman. Dear Vic, Norman and I have been watching you, Ben and Mark, for quite a while. We love the show and we were wondering if you could give us a bit of info. A friend of ours added a special blend of Aussie flavours into a fruit salad that she made. Norm and I tried it and can honestly say that it was the best fruit salad that I have ever tasted. That's quite a rave. And I cannot remember what she said it was, but I do know that it was fantastic. It was fruit and, and summer in the middle of winter. Hmm, good taste description, eh, fellas? Oh, mate, how do you I wonder what she put in. How can I make it myself? It was a real taste experience. Ben, what do you reckon she put into it? Uh, rainforest rub, maybe? I don't know. Mullen Bimbi Madness? Well, one of the really great flavour enhancers for fruits, obviously, forest berry herb, lemon myrtle would work. There'd be a whole host of things. We'll have to refer this to really anybody who wants to be creative with foot, with, uh, with the herbs and the fruits. Ryeberries would be great, wild limes would be great. Any of them, you grab them, put them into an international fruit salad and you've turned the flavours upside down.